Neurotherapy Assistant Professor and Principal Investigator in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Washington. She develops tools for microbiome and biodiversity analysis. She is interested um, in reproducible research, meaningful data analysis, and collaborates with scientists who share those values. She has been a recipient of NIH Outstanding Investigator Award and University of Washington Outstanding Mentor Award. Please check her Twitter and her website. And on this, Dr. Willis, please take it away. Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I was just saying to folks who uh, who were here a bit earlier that, um, as was just mentioned, my uh, my home is Seattle. I love living in Seattle. I'm very sorry I can't be there in person today. Um, I uh, had a prior commitment on the East Coast for traveling, so um, feel free to connect with me uh, in any of the ways here through through Twitter or email. Um, and I look forward to. Uh, been terrific to see the programming that's been happening at Bioconductor 2022. Um, so this is actually my first time presenting at a Bioconductor, um, a Bioconductor conference. Um, yeah, I'm a passionate member of the open source community, uh, but I thought that since this is the first time I'm presenting here, I might start off just by introducing myself and some of the work that I do. Um, so I really, I'm a statistician. I have uh, a fair bit of training um, in statistics at this point, and I really believe that statistics um, exists to serve uh, the sciences. And so to that end, um, collaborated with folks on a number of different projects. I'm really passionate about biodiversity. So I've got some projects here looking at um, annelids and looking at an Arctic woolly mammoth, uh, reconstructions of its lifetime movement from isotope data, as well as um, looking at uh, very hard to detect members of the oral microbiome. Um, to support some of this work in the analysis of biodiversity data, I uh, develop methods for its analysis. And so you can um, take a look at uh, some of these uh, these methods here. These are mostly focused on um, developing new new methods for the analysis of emerging structures in uh, in the analysis of microbiome data. So I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, you know, I think that one of the uh, most important things our statisticians and um, data analysts can do to support uh, modern science is to bridge uh, disciplinary divides. And so I take this outreach uh, and uh, interdisciplinary communication work really seriously. And I think that um, some of the uh, tools that have allowed me to uh, better collaborate and better communicate with folks in, in biological fields include um, penning uh, uh, some sort of perspective pieces, trying to frame some of the questions that statisticians think about for microbial ecologists. Um, and I've got a couple of uh, open source software projects that I'm really excited about listed on the bottom as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, more recent uh, methodological work that I've done. Um, all of this is accompanied by open source software, of course, and I'm particularly going to focus on um, a preprint that we uh, put up a couple of months ago. It's called Modeling Complex Measurement Error in Microbiome Experiments. So feel free to check out uh, that paper on archive um, if you would like more details. And I'm happy to answer questions, of course. Um, sounds like at the end is, is how we're doing them. So the story that I'm going to um, tell today, I'm going to start from um, background for folks who have relatively little familiarity with um, microbiome data specifically. Um, but this story really begins with the advent of, of high throughput sequencing. And as we mentioned many times um, yesterday, high throughput sequencing is this incredible technology that allows us to analyze genomic data sets at this <coughs> unprecedented scale and also um, at an unprecedented, uh, um, unprecedentedly low cost. So this, uh, the, the advent of high throughput sequencing has really revolutionized the way that we study biology as well as the way that we study medicine. And so one thing that distinguishes high throughput sequencing from sort of classical approaches to studying ecological communities um, is that it is an indirect way of obtaining information about um, the genomic source or the community that's under study. So if I think back to how ecological surveys were done um, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you know, folks um, with a lot of sunscreen and bug nets were sitting there counting their frogs on their on their clipboards and counting different fishes um, in a net or different spiders um, that are caught in these traps. High throughput sequencing is totally unlike that. Um, there are all of these uh, all of these different steps in the um, laboratory preparation procedure, which I'll talk more about in a second. Before I do that, I'll just give a little um, introduction to uh, microbiomes or communities of microscopic organisms, which are going to be the focus of um, of this talk today and indeed most of my current work. 
Um, so uh, you may or may not know that that you're not wholly comprised of uh, your eukaryotic self. You actually carry, um, you know, approximately ten times more bacterial cells on your body than human cells. If we think about what um, that bacterial complement is able to help you with, um, it actually adds an enormous amount of, of function to what you can do. Um, and so, for example, we've got 22, about 22,000 genes in the human genome, but the combined complement of genes from the microbes that you walk around with um, is maybe on the order of uh, 8 to 10 million. So what do these bacteria do for you? They help fight off viruses. Um, they help you break down your food and metabolize and absorb nutrients. Um, and I guess maybe one of my favorite facts is that uh, eukaryotic cells are uh, descended from um, bacterial and archaeal cells, and so I like to think of them um, on my good days as my distant cousins as well. So, so these are, we often think about pathogens, but our commensal organisms help us a great deal with, um, uh, with living and existing. Okay. And so um, a common data structure that we see in, uh, that we often see in um, the analysis of microbiome data is, um, is count data, could also be coverage data. This is not, this is not such an important distinction, but we're often thinking about um, matrices of the form of samples by, uh, by taxa or taxonomic groups, species or strains. And so I'm gonna, throughout this talk, think about um, WIJ as the number of times a given strain J is observed in sample I. So what we see um, in this example data set from um, Brooks and co-authors is uh, that in sample one, we observed Lactobacillus crispatus 19 times and Lactobacillus inners about four times. In contrast, Lactobacillus crispatus was observed uh, zero times in this second sample. Okay. And so a um, assumption that underpins a lot of the work in statistics um, on, on the modeling of, of microbiome data is, uh, is concerned with true relative abundances of, of strains, species or taxa, um, in samples. So I'm going to let PIJ reflect the, the true relative abundance of taxon J in sample I. And a common assumption that underpins a lot of methods, um, including uh, CONCOB and DEC um, and, and many more that, that we can chat about in detail in question time, is that the expected number of counts we observe in the I sample for the J strain is proportional to this true relative abundance with some um, sample specific scaling factor that I'm going to call CI here. And so um, if this is a, a core assumption of uh, many methods for um, estimating abundance in microbial communities or looking at differential abundance across different sample types, um, I think it's really important to investigate this assumption and, and see, do we, have, do we have good evidence for this, uh, this, is, this working assumption being the case? So how can we do that? So one really interesting data structure that exists in microbiome sequencing, and I think is kind of unique in microbiome sequencing, as opposed to other high throughput sequencing um, technologies, such as RNA-seq, for example, is we have this validation data that we can use uh, called, called mock communities. So mock communities are artificially constructed um, communities of, of known composition, and they've been really well used in the bioinformatics and computational biology literature but not so much in the statistical literature. So, so this is sort of where we begin today. And so mock communities um, have, have true known composition, right? So what I'm um, showing here is that I'm gonna show four samples and, and seven, uh, seven species. And we see that that first sample is comprised 100% of Streptococcus agalactiae, and none of the other six uh, strains are present in that sample. In contrast, the second sample here is comprised uh, in equal or one-to-one parts by Aptopia vaginae and Prevotella bivia, and then this third and fourth sample have uh, one to one to one ratios of three taxa each. Okay, so this is a great tool that we can use uh, to, to investigate these some of the assumptions that underpin a lot of the methods that are used in microbiome analysis. And so it may or may not surprise you that that uh, data table that I showed earlier actually originated from this community. So I'll let that, um, I'll let you all look at that for a second, and then I'll um, pull out a couple of really interesting pieces. So one thing um, that I'll notice here is that we're observing strains in samples in which they should be absent. So as I said earlier, we observed Lactobacillus crispatus 19 times in this first sample in which it should not be present, um, or we know it not to be present. Another really interesting feature that we see looking here is that while we have uh, known equal ratios, let's say in this third sample, of Lactobacillus crispatus and Lactobacillus inners, um, as well as Prevotella bivia, 
we observe many more reads from Lactobacillus innus compared to that of Lactobacillus crispatus. We observe about two and a half times more, maybe around 11,000 Lactobacillus innus reads in uh, this third sample compared to about 4,800 Lactobacillus crispatuses um, in samples in which they should be present in the same abundance. So I'll just um, make those two observations again because they're going to be pretty important for the model that, um, that I go on to, to talk about today. Is, is firstly that we notice that despite equal mixing fractures, some fractions, some taxa are observed many more times than others. And then also despite um, supposedly being absent, we observe taxa in, in which we shouldn't. Okay. And so what I'm gonna um, focus on for the rest of this talk is uh, using this control data to, um, to propose and, and justify and validate a model that maybe better reflects underlying biology of these communities than the uh, assumptions underpinned by this working assumption that I introduced earlier, where we had that counts were proportional to true relative abundances. Okay, so this is work with um, David Clausen, who's a fifth year PhD student in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Washington and has just been an absolute joy to work with. And so um, David and I worked on, um, worked on the following model. So we're gonna decompose um, the expected number of counts in a sample attributable to a taxon as comprising of two pieces. So that first piece is contributions from what should be present in, uh, in, in this environment. And then the second piece is contributions from what we can broadly think of as uh, contamination, things that, that shouldn't actually be um, picked up in our sample because we know that they shouldn't be there. So I'll dive in more detail into this contribution of sample piece first. So what, I've, what I'm showing here is um, more mock community data. And this is also um, mock community data from the Brooks and co-authors paper that I mentioned earlier. And so what you'll notice is in common about these five um, communities. So in this top panel, I've got true relative abundances. We see that this, the first and second samples are, are in, and third samples are comprised of one to one to one mixtures of three different taxa denoted by different colors. Um, all of the five samples that I've pulled up here both have this green taxon and this blue taxon present uh, present in these communities. And what we observe is that we're, we're consistently observing a lot more of these uh, observations due to this green taxon compared to due to this blue taxon. So let's think about the ratio of number of um, observations attributable to each of these taxa. And I would claim that this is a we, we're consistently observing about 18 times more observations due to Lactobacillus innus, the green taxon, compared to Streptococcus agalactiae. And so um, I think for folks who've looked at high throughput sequencing data, um, you, might, you might think, uh, or, or as someone who's looked at a lot of high throughput sequencing data, I would say this is a pretty consistent um, single signal to noise ratio uh, compared to a lot of what we see in this field. And so is this um, some fluke? Am I cherry picking the two taxa that I'm taking the ratios of? Um, well, well, let's take a look. So here's a plot where we've got pairs of taxa on the um, on the x-axis, and I've showed my uh, we observe approximately 18 more copies of Lactobacillus innus to each copy of Streptococcus agalactiae in communities in which they're present in equal abundances. Um, and if we look at all of the other pairs of taxa, I would say we also have um, pretty consistent uh, over detection, and in particular over detection um, of uh, one taxon relative to another in a pretty constant multiplicative proportion. Okay, so we're observing um, in this first, uh, on the most left-hand side of this plot, approximately 30 times more lactobacillus innus compared to Gardnerella vaginalis. Um, and this is true regardless of uh, the number of species present in each of these, these mixtures. Um, so, so this is, I think, a pretty, a pretty strong signal and a pretty good indication of what sort of model we should be considering in this scenario. And so I'm gonna claim that this, um, this data, everything I've shown up until now, provides um, pretty compelling evidence against this model where we have expected counts as proportional to the true um, relative abundances and much stronger support for a model where we have our expected counts are proportional to the product of our true relative abundances as well as strain specific detection effects or what I'm going to call or, or what's commonly known in um, the microbiome field as uh, detection efficiencies. So I'm going to let that EJ term um, denote, denote efficiencies here. For estimation purposes later, it'll be convenient to work with these on the log scale. So we've got um, an exponentiated form of this model as well. Of course, we're going to hang, into, hang on to our um, sample specific sampling intensities, CI, in addition. Okay, so 
I think one thing, it's one thing to sort of see this model and say like, yes, that, um, that seems, uh, that all seems fine and good, but what are the real implications of failing to consider taxon, taxon specific efficiencies when we go to do modeling? Um, so the model that I'm claiming is that we're looking at, uh, if we go from looking at counts to looking at relative proportions, we can consider observed relative proportions as proportional to true proportions of taxa in environments multiplied by taxon specific efficiencies. So what's the impact of, of failing to account for these taxon specific efficiencies? So let's consider just a toy example, noiseless setting, um, where we're looking at maybe a treatment sample and a control sample. And, and this could be population level data. It's, it's not so important here. So it would be very nice um, to look at this data that appears on our desk and say, um, that the conclude that the relative abundance of this orange taxon, which is maybe a pathogen, let's say, decreased in the treatment sample compared to in, in the control sample, because we observe a decrease from 42% to 24% um, in terms of these relative proportions. So perniciously, what could have generated this exact observed data is the opposite, where in fact we had an increase in the relative abundance of this orange pathogen from 20% relative abundance to 33% relative abundance going from control to treatment. So, so a, a change in the opposite direction to what we're observing in our data. So what could have driven this effect? The following taxon specific de uh, detection efficiencies could have, could have given rise to this. So we had one, um, one taxon that was extremely easy to detect, this green taxon observed 18 times more easily than this blue taxon, and then um, and also observed about three times, or observed three times uh, more easily than this orange taxon, so six to 18, um, one to three. And so what's happening here is that because this green taxon is also changing in relative abundance, uh, going from 5% relative abundance to 33% relative abundance, and also because it's very easy to detect, it's sort of eating up a lot of this relative abundance pie that's available and edging out um, sort of this, this orange taxon in showing us which direction it's moving. So, so really critically here, what we're finding, what we, what we see and what this example shows is that it's not the relative abundance of one taxon um, that's important, but the relative abundance of all taxa that are important, as well as their detection efficiencies. So this is a, essentially why um, this detection efficiency problem poses such a big challenge to, to analyzing this data and making scientific conclusions, drawing scientific conclusions from it. Okay, so I'll wrap up this um, sort of uh, subsection on talking about um, contributions from uh, the sample, so what we know to be present in these communities, um, as saying that this piece in expectation is the product of true relative abundances, sample specific intensities, reflecting that some, uh, some of these samples have many more observations attributed to them than others. For example, this first row has about um, 51,000 observations observed in total, and the second row has about um, 20, 21,000 observations uh, observed in total. And then in addition, we need this term that accounts for different uh, degrees to which taxa are, um, are detected. So the fact that, as we noted earlier, Lactobacillus inners is observed about two and a half times uh, more easily than Lactobacillus crispatus. So that's our contribution from sample piece. Let's move on to chatting about the reason why we have uh, non-zero numbers of observations from taxa that, that shouldn't be present, that should be observed zero times. So the model that I'm going to consider here is pretty similar um, to the one that I introduced earlier. We've also, we're going to think of contamination profiles. So we're going to think of um, potentially capital K tilde uh, sources of contamination that could be impacting um, our reads. Each of these uh, contaminant relative abundance profiles have an intensity that they contribute. And then we also have that samples sequenced more deeply in total um, also uh, sort of blow up the number of uh, the amount of contamination in absolute terms that we observe in them. Um, so, so this is just a nice piece that um, gives us some explanation for why we're observing non-zero counts uh, of taxa that should be absent. Okay, so let's put those pieces together. Um, we've got a bunch of notation here that I've thrown at you relatively quickly. Essentially, we've got this piece due to what should be there and this piece what due to what shouldn't be there. Um, and, and I'm a statistician, right, so I like to think very generally in terms of experimental design um, and, and possible ways that folks could be running these experiments. And so I'm going to introduce, um, just so you know that this is a fairly general model, 
um, a couple of matrices, a couple of different design matrices. So one that links uh, samples to specimens, for example, if folks have replicates, technical replicates that they want to sequence. Um, another that potentially links these different detection effects to different batches or different um, sample preparation methods. That's this X matrix. And then we've also got um, you know, different ways that samples can share contamination profiles, and that's coming in through this Z tilde matrix. So that's a that's a bunch of notation. Feel free to um, take a look at the paper if you uh, want to dive into more detail here. So how are we going to estimate parameters in this model? Um, well, we're going to propose using um, likelihood-based tools to do so. And so um, we're going to uh, model our, our counts, um, conditional on our paramet parameters um, as Poisson distributed with means given as uh, stated previously. Um, and critically, I'll talk about the Poisson assumption in a second um, and whether or not that's something we're really going to lean on. Uh, spoiler alert, we're not. Um, but, but critically here, in order to fit this model, we need at least some parameters to be known in this model. So for example, we're imagining this being most useful in a setting where folks are uh, investigating samples of known composition as control data alongside samples of unknown composition. Um, so maybe uh, maybe that's a setup, or maybe we know that um, we're, we're going to set one, uh, we're going to sequence the same samples in multiple different ways, um, and we're going to set one of those as the baseline, and we'll be estimating different uh, detection effects, one protocol relative to another. So one of the really nice um, features of using this estimation approach is that it results in estimators for our, our proportions as well as for our detection effects that are consistent under very general conditions. And in particular, we don't need to assume that these counts are actually Poisson distributed as long as we've correctly specified our mean model. So this is um, consistency in a very, very general sense that's not tethered to distributional assumptions about WIJ. So really we're thinking about this likelihood-based approach um, as giving us estimating equations. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that the Poisson distribution makes strong assumptions about the relationship between the mean and variance of observations. And so uh, a tool that we have to improve efficiency is to perform maximum weighted likelihood where we're looking at um, estimating some variance function as a result of looking at squared residuals, for example. Um, and we can make structural constraints like uh, fitting that model with a isotonic regression as a reweighting approach. So um, some nice details in the paper if, you, if you'd like to look more closely at that. So estimation in this setting um, is really interesting. Um, because some of the parameters that we're trying to estimate do not fall in the interior of the parameter space in which they can live. And so um, we've got these relative abundances that are not only uh, in the simplex, so a given um, sum of uh, proportions has to add up, has to, add up um, to one, but we also want to allow maximum likelihood estimates to potentially fall on the boundary. So specifically, we want to permit true relative abundances to, or true estimated relative abundances to be exactly zero. We don't want to assume that every, uh, every strain, every species occurs in every sample. That's not biologically plausible. So how are we going to do that? So we consider um, breaking up our algorithm for estimation into two pieces. We've got this uh, first, met first uh, set of steps, um, which is a barrier method, and then another, um, then followed by a profiling step. So the idea here is that we've got this really unstable estimation problem. And so we're first going to consider this in, um, a setting where we're going to uh, enforce that our estimated relative abundances fall in the interior of the simplex, um, interior of uh, the, the space of um, observations between zero and one that add up to one. And then we're going to, at the final step, allow those estimates of relative abundance to move onto the boundary if it increases the likelihood. And that's done via a profiling step. And so essentially the way that this barrier method step works, so we're, we want to really carefully control the way that these, um, way that we're increasing our likelihood and the way that our estimates are changing along the steps of this algorithm as we go forward, is we're turning this um, quite unstable constrained optimization problem into a sequence of unconstrained optimization problems. So we're maximizing not our likelihood, but our likelihood plus this other term controlled by a hyperparameter T. Um, so we originally start with a, a small T and we say solve this problem and then initializing that um, that the next step of our algorithm, we're going to increase T by, for example, tenfold. And so we're, we're looking at maximizing a function that's more like our likelihood. And then we repeat that again until, until T is really large. Um, at any individual step of this optimization, we're going to use regularized Fisher scoring. So uh, second degree, second order um, approximation of our likelihood. So, so the interesting thing about this is that we're at each step of this algorithm only going to... Um, 
uh, enforce that our relative abundances are, are greater than zero or, or between zero and one. And we can do that um, and enforce this, uh, this simplex constraint that they add up to one, but while being strictly greater than zero by reparametrizing our relative abundances using log ratios. So this is just a, a nice um, reparametrization trick to allow this interior of the simplex constraint. Um, so a profiling step, once we've got to, um, we've got estimates that approximate something that's really similar to our likelihood, but not quite, um, we want to allow our estimated relative abundances to potentially fall on the boundary of the simplex. And we're going to do that um, with a constrained Newton's method uh, within this augmented Lagrangian term. So you'll notice that this is not, not your typical Lagrangian. We've got two uh, pieces that, um, that enforce this constraint. And we're going to solve this problem using non-negative least squares. Um, essentially, we no longer... Uh, have this log ratio parameterization, and that's one piece that allows us to potentially have estimates on the boundary of the simplex. And of course, we're only going to take this up, update step um, if it increases our likelihood. So we have this um, uh, additional step here to make sure that we're increasing our likelihood at this step. Happy to take more questions on this, and um, yeah, very excited about this. So the final piece that I'll introduce um, before talking about a couple of examples um, is some really interesting considerations regarding statistical inference or hypothesis testing in this setting. And so, um, so as I've talked about, and one of the challenges is for estimation is that our parameters are not guaranteed to lie uh, in the interior of the space in which they can fall. And so a lot of our conditions for um, uh, our regularity conditions for doing asymptotic analysis break down here um, because, you know, looking at... Uh, you may remember from your first uh, intro stats class, but that we're assuming that parameters fall in the interior of the space in which they can fall. So coming up with um, an asymptotic distribution or describing the asymptotic distribution of things like test statistics or estimators is not trivial here. And so um, a lot of uh, digging into what possibilities we have here landed us on um, this, this really amazing um, bootstrap alternative. So we're not doing just your regular um, multinomial bootstrap. We're going to consider a modification which is uh, still um, giving us asymptotic, correct asymptotic distributions for estimators when we have parameters that potentially fall on the boundary of, of their space. And so what we've got um, here is a result showing that if we're looking at um, a, a subsampled bootstrap, um, and so we're looking at uh, P, um, N, uh, sub, uh, super Z distribution here. So this is a uh, weighted empirical distribution where the weights of each of the observations that we draw are, are coming from a Dirichlet distribution with an M over N. Um, uh, parameters and we need to have uh, M and, and N becoming um, both becoming large and in particular um, uh, M becoming small relative to N. So, so there's some really interesting considerations here and um, if you're curious about these questions and, and um, I think this is just a really great example where theory and practice merge together um, in a, uh, in a interest, in interesting ways. So feel free to check out those details if you're interested and I'm happy to take questions during question time. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you how um, this tool and this, uh, this method can be used uh, in a couple of different um, ways for the analysis of microbiome data. And so a common situation that, that folks are interested in is choosing between different possible experiments that they could run. Um, and so this is a setting, this is data from Costea and co-authors published in 2017, um, where the authors were setting out to investigate which of three different ways that they could run their sequencing was the, the best one. And so what they did is they took um, 10 samples, I think, believe they're human stool, and into each of these samples, they mixed a synthetic community of 10 different bacteria. And then they um, split their samples up, sequenced all samples according to each of these three protocols. And then a sort of a validation approach um, looked at some flow cytometry data. And so one of the really interesting things about the analysis that these authors did is that they could look at their flow cytometry a relative abundance profiles and look at their sequencing sequencing profiles and say they don't quite match which looks to be the best. So that's sort of the old framing in terms of counts proportional to true relative abundances. But it was really hard to do anything with this. So let me show you how we can do a little more um, nuanced analysis with this new tool. So what I'm going to show here um, are, according to each of these three different protocols, um, relative abundances measured by this uh, validation um, technology, flow cytometry, against the estimated relative abundances for every one of our um, in colors, each of these 10 specimens, and across the x-axis, we essentially have different strains. So what we're observing is that some taxa are um, consistently observed way less than they should be, 
Um, and, and very few, uh, you know, these, these lines are not on the x equals y line, and so we're really struggling to see um, which, if any, taxa are, are estimated correctly with respect to their relative abundances. So if we fit a model that fails to account for detection effects across taxa, which explains why we could consistently be under-detecting taxa in, um, in, in, in all of our samples, um, we, we end up with a model like, like this. So this is essentially um, correcting for uh, contamination um, in samples. And we still see we've got some deviation from the x equals y line. If we fit this full model, the one that I've introduced already, we, I think, can see something quite stark which is that protocol W, while still you know, biased in some sense towards detecting some taxa compared to others, is much lower variance than protocols H and Q. So I think this is, um, this is a nice way of reframing, not how can we uh, improve the, how can we can choose a protocol that's accurate on average, but here we can start to say, we're never gonna get accuracy. We can correct for this uh, bias in relative abundance estimates, and the challenge that we want to do is minimize variance. Okay, so we're optimizing precision now. Um, we're, we're prioritizing precision now over um, over accuracy. And I think, or we're prioritizing both precision and accuracy. But we can choose a protocol that's uh, an experimental protocol that's low variance because we now have a tool to improve accuracy. Another really important um, way in which this method can be used is to remove contamination in samples. And so the idea is that um, a lot of the tools that currently exist in the microbiome literature for removing contamination label taxa as contaminant or non-contaminant and don't have sort of a, well, maybe it's a contaminant in this sample from this, sa this other sample framing. And so um, what we're, uh, we're going to advocate for here is, is a tool, an experimental tool called dilution series, where instead of just processing, where instead of biologists processing their sample, they process their sample as well as uh, that same sample diluted down with, say, water in a one to three ratio, and then maybe again, one to nine ratio and so on. Because what we can see sort of from this graphic here is that the proportion of contaminants, if contamination is constant across all samples, we see that the pro proportion of contaminants is greater in these more diluted samples. Okay, so um, so let's take a look at, at what this looks like. This is data from Carstens and co-authors, um, you know, made this claim that we have contamination in our samples. Um, and, and my evidence, or one piece of evidence for this, is that in a uh, community in which we know there to be only eight strains present, we observe 248 strains in total. So 240 contaminants um, in this data set across, I think, nine samples or so. So, so what um, Carson's and co-authors were looking at was eight bacterial strains mixed in equal ratios, 12.5% each, um, and they have dilution series of each of these samples. And so uh, what this model that we've introduced now can account for is not only these detection effects that we're not expecting to see 12% uh, observed reads, but also contamination being greater in these diluted samples. So let's just take a look. If we, if we take a look on the left here, we've got um, observed uh, relative abundances of each of these eight taxa, along with um, other being contaminants. And then on the right-hand side, we've got uh, what sh what's known to be present in these communities. If we dilute this sample down three to one and sequence it again, um, you can see we observe slightly different proportions and maybe a slightly different proportion of these contaminants, slightly increased relative abundance of, of other over here. And as we continue to dilute, again, one to three, so one to nine uh, ratio of our original, we're seeing more and more contamination. So we jump up to a five fold, or five rounds of dilution in one to three, we're now observing about 25% of our reads coming from contaminants. And if we're looking at an eightfold uh, three to one dilution, we're getting almost 80% of our sequences coming from contaminants. So this is what that full data set looks like. So what I'm gonna do, we've only got nine samples here. So um, we're gonna, gonna do what we can. We're gonna do um, threefold cross validation. And so if we fit this model that I've described earlier, we see um, a much improved uh, estimates of relative, uh, relative composition. We're um, getting much closer to this 12.5% for each taxon line. Again, we're uh, learning on um, uh, six samples and then uh, training on three. Um, and these folds are done in a way such that we're not communicating information across different folds. Um, and then similarly for the second fold and so on for this third fold. So I would say that we're learning a pretty as much as we can from a relatively small data set and that this dilution series is a pretty um, low difficulty, low expense um, technique that folks can use in the wet lab that they can then combine with these analytical tools in order to uh, reduce the um, 
impact of contaminants on their analysis. Um, and in particular, one thing I was really excited about for this example was that um, if we look at 95% confidence intervals for our true relative abundances for 238 of the 240 total, uh, contaminants, um, our true confidence intervals for their presence in the community were in covered zero. So I think our you know, in practice empirical coverage is, is pretty great. Pretty good, I'm pretty pleased with that. So there's um, a lot of ongoing work that I'm really excited to do in this area. Um, a big piece of this is experimental design. How do we, um, how do we use uh, these techniques and these insights in order to help biologists better spend their money and better allocate um, their energy uh, across, for example, choosing between replicates and choosing between dilution series? How do we best encourage folks to collect the right type of control data? There's also all of these interesting um, questions sort of at the interface of biology and engineering about, well, how conserved is the detection of a specific strain across phylogeny? So if we're looking at um, comparing uh, two different species uh, in the same genus, um, do we have, can we learn things about the detection, the ability to detect one species from, from another? Um, you know, I alluded earlier to this, uh, some of the mathematical challenges regarding um, estimation, and I said sort of vaguely, we need some some things to be known, whether uh, we need our p's or our betas to be known, um, and this is essentially getting towards identifiability. So some more general understanding of identifiability on the algebra side, I think, um, is an important consideration. And then the holy grail of this research area is enabling biologists to do meta-analysis. So to combine data sets that have been constructed maybe in different continents, um, definitely in different labs, probably in different batches, um, and combining them in a way to essentially have um, uh, improve the estimation of uh, whether it's treatment effects or, or, or disease effects, um, as well as uh, power to look for a differentially abundant taxa across uh, different sample types. So um, for folks who are not in the microbiome literature, I thought I'd, or not working in this area, I thought I'd give um, just a couple of sort of takeaways from the at the highest level um, of what I think we can learn from this quite specific example from microbial ecology. And, and the main one is about model validation. So um, statisticians and computational biologists and biologists have for many years uh, used these models that weren't validated and were built on this assumption that the expected counts um, attributable to a, a species were proportional to their true relative abundance. And along through that example that I showed earlier, where we had a decrease in one taxon, uh, a decrease in a taxon that manifested as an increase, um, we saw that uh, this is a model that can really mislead us, can really take us in the in the opposite direction from from what biology is going on under the hood. Um, and so, you know, if you're in a field, I'd love you to think about what creative ways and what um, what uh, what tools are out there are what tools are available to you to do model validation uh, in, in your setting. And so, um, in our setting, we were looking at this control data. Um, that through mock communities, this had previously been largely gone unused by the statistical community, but we found to be really um, useful for evaluating model specification. And so um, alongside all of this work, you know, as I've said before, the really the only way to um, get useful tools, uh, make useful tools is to distribute them as open source software, in my opinion. So um, all of this methodology is implemented as an R package uh, known as TinyVamp. Um, something I'm really excited to, um, to chat about with folks is uh, you know how do you balance um, how do you find the right balance of uh, tutorials and vignettes that you put together when you're focused on developing a method that's very flexible and so that's something that um, you know we're really sort of grappling with at the moment how how much support um, all of the different how given that there are so many ways to use this method what could we um, do to better support our users. So um, this research thread has come together over many years. Um, this paper that I mostly talked about today is work with David Clawson, who's uh, just someone, a student that I've been so lucky to, to work with. Um, but some of the earlier ideas for this work uh, were done in were uh, worked on in collaboration with Mike McLaren and Ben Callahan um, at NC State uh, for Ben and now MIT for Mike, or um, actually, uh, yeah, MIT for Mike, as well as with Jim Hughes and Brian Williamson at the University of Washington. And I'm really grateful um, to the National Institute for General Medical Science for funding this work. Um, so that was all I had prepared for you today. Um, I would really be excited to take questions. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here.
All right. Thank you. This was great. Uh, let's see if we have some questions from live audience. Can you hear me OK? I can. I'd just like to say thank you for your talk. I am um, currently working at OHSU, and I'm working on a metagenomic shotgun sequencing microbial analysis of esophageal cancer progression. Lisa Karsten, who you referenced, is <laughs> she's on our project right now, but this is kind of a small world moment. But I've been personally working on the viral genome detection of the double-stranded DNA non-RNA stage viruses that integrate into the human genome. And it's been difficult to normalize the counts based on all of the things that you talked about, about the high complexity regions and detection and things like that. So I'll be sending you probably a little bit of a long email after this, <laughs> but I just wanted to That's um, wonderful. Yeah, bring that up that, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of interplay and in what, what drives diseases in terms of the human microbiome, but this has been just a really wonderful talk. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really, um, really appreciate that. And I look forward to your email. Um, you know, I actually uh, saw some data from some of my colleagues at CF Children's quite recently who were also looking at um, viral mock communities um, and this question of uh, single-stranded, double-stranded DNA, RNA viruses. Um, and, and how does this impact their detection efficiencies is something that, um, that I, at this point, know very little about. But I'm hoping that this is uh, an emerging research area. Um, and I really look forward to seeing what you find. Thanks so much for introducing yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Hello. Um, so I have two questions for you. I really enjoyed your talk. And um, my first question is the model that you proposed and fit to um, data sets on the order of 10 uh, species, if I understood correctly. One of, one of the things I wondered about it is it seems to have a lot of parameters and microbiome data oftentimes is very sparse. And so I'm wondering whether it's even possible to fit such a model to, to true microbiome data when you don't have the same organisms across many samples that you've sequenced. And so you're trying to fit a, a model, if I understood correctly, with many parameters to sparse data. Yeah, fantastic question. Thanks so much for asking it. So if you look at the, um, the, the dimension of our data and if you look at the dimension of our parameter space, I would say that, you know, in, in general, we're not going to be able to estimate individual relative abundances for every taxon in every sample. And this sort of gets at this point of identifiability. So what sort of replicate data is needed? You know, if we sequence the same sample multiple times, that's giving us more information. Um, and, and how can we better leverage what we have? So that that's one question or that's one piece of my response to, to your excellent question. The other thing that um, I think is important is that, you know, for the purposes of maybe different comparing um, across samples or across sample types, the um, this, challenge is a, this challenge of the um, WIJ is such that WIJ equals zero, this zeros problem, um, is something that uh, is really important to consider. I would say that given that we're trying to estimate relative abundances, that sounds like really good information to me that our true underlying relative abundances are also zero if we're failing to observe them um, in many samples. And so, um, you know, this doesn't worry me for the purposes of this calibration model as much as it does for, uh, you know, differential abundance comparison, for example. Um, so, and, and, you know, to speak to your question about um, dimension of our parameter space, you know, you said that there were 10 species in this uh, Carson's data, actually there were 248 species in this data set and they could be fit relatively quickly. Um, I just showed uh, and then collapsed a bunch into other for the purposes of visualization. So I've been um, encouraged to realize how much we can learn from um, learn from these data sets, even though of course we do have uh, parameter space dimension plus data um, dimension considerations, absolutely. But it, I think it mostly impacts asymptotics is my long answer to your points that you bring up, but happy to chat more about this. This is um, happy to go into more detail. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so my second question is one source of contam contamination in microbiome uh, samples in my experience is barcode crosstalk. So on Lumina, when you multiplex, uh, you get this problem where some samples bleed into other samples because of the demultiplexing error. So mm -hmm. it seemed to me like if you, um, 
if you were to just dilute the sample, the barcode crosstalk would remain at a constant abundance. It would not appear to increase in abundance. And so I was wondering whether your model at all fits barcode crosstalk as one possible source of contamination, how that would be dealt with. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much for bringing that up. So this question of, um, of, of barcodes that don't fully anneal and therefore hop from one sample to another, so index hopping or, or um, is one term that this phenomenon has been given, is something I've considered in a couple of settings, and I've, I've looked at it um, from a modeling perspective where we explicitly try to model, um, you know, hops from one uh, one read to another, and that, that becomes computationally intractable very quickly. And so one of the nice things about this model, or, or a place in which I'm optimistic, is that if you know the true composition of some samples and you also have barcode hopping, that piece is going to be estimated as part of your background contamination profile. And so essentially you're going to have small quantities of every one of your taxa in your contaminant profile, even if those contaminants are coming um, in the experimental sample preparation process. And so, um, you know, this 238 out of 240 taxa being estimated or having confidence intervals for their true composition that cover zero um, gives me a lot of hope, actually, that we can still be estimating true zero abundances, even in the presence of, um, of, of crosstalk or, or this index hopping phenomenon um, that you talk about. So I think that's a bit more detail than I went into today, but I'm happy to chat more about this offline. Um, I would say that this method does but it sort of gets at it indirectly. Um, that maybe better than nothing is where I would where I would end that. Thanks for that great question. All right, we have a few questions from virtual audience. So the first one is from Mike Love, and his question is: Will meta analysis require inevitably original count data from all studies, or? Is there a summary statistics solution that will be good enough? Great question, Mike. That, um, that is really interesting. I think um, depending in particular on the scale, I, I guess, you know, maybe there's some different people. So one is, um, you know, what, what are we estimating? Are we estimating maybe like average treatment effect across different, different cohorts? Maybe in that case, doing meta-analysis through these tools. Um, could be uh, enabled by the use of summary statistics if you know count data has been maybe um, not available, for example. Um, I would have to think about that more though. That, that's my sort of off the cuff um, response to that question. Um, I guess on the on the other side, you know, if um, you know not everyone's publishing their their count data, and one of the nice things about this Poisson um, approach to giving us estimating equations is that. Um, uh, we don't actually have to have count data. We could be looking at coverage data. I guess we could be looking at proportion data, um, though in that case, we're losing information about differential precision across samples and maybe some ability to estimate the mean variance relationship um, across uh, um, across the breadth of our counts. Um, but I'll th have to think more about this question of um, meta-analysis and summary statistics, because I admit that's not something I've thought about in too much detail. But um, thanks so much for that very interesting thought. All right, another question from Alex Imans, and this was fantastic. It was indeed. How does this modeling compare across sample types? Does it work equally well for less diverse sample types like human gut versus more diverse sample types like soils? Yeah, fantastic question. So um, thanks so much, Alex, and I appreciate the kind, uh, kind words as well. Um, so I guess there's a few different things uh, that, that leave into my mind in, in response to this question. So one is that um, there are, of course, computational challenges uh, with looking at more diverse environments. So the bigger, it increases the dimension of your data, it increases the dimension of your parameter space. Um, and so computation will inevitably take longer um, if you're looking at calibration with respect to, um, for example, high diversity soil environments compared to low diversity environments, such as the human vaginal microbiome. The other um, thing that you bring up is uh, this comparison across sample types. And so I think that uh, an interesting question and something that we're looking at that is not um, well documented at this point is what is the impact of the extracellular matrix on these detection efficiencies? And so, um, you know, are efficiencies essentially the same if we're looking at like saline environments, saline environments for marine samples compared to freshwater environments? Um, or, you know, is the amount of like carbohydrates 
uh, in stool impacting detection effects for the same taxa. So, so I think that my um, current on this are that for comparisons within relatively simple sample types, efficiencies are pretty consistent. And this is data from that paper with McLaren, um, McLaren and co-authors. Um, I think the question is a little more, or I think we have less information about comparing across very different samples. And so these sort of gross or like large scale extrapolations um, and large scale, like comparing very heterogeneous data types um, is sort of a, a challenge on the biological and model building side. Um, more so than on the statistical side, but I'm looking to see um, as more data emerges um, what we can say about that. So I, I hope that um, addresses your question in a couple different ways. All right, and another question from Mike. Are the models and inference methods uh, relevant for questions about single cell composition? For example, single types may have efficiency differences that may lead to over detection. Um, I, uh, I I didn't fully capture uh, didn't fully catch that question, um, but if I understand, um, it sounded like Mike was curious about generalizability of this model to single cell data, for example, um, and, and other input genomic data types. Um, and I would say that I guess having spent many years working with microbial communities, um, I, I can uh, attest to um, I think the strength of this model in that scenario, and I'm. I'm curious to um, hear from actually from you and other folks who have expertise in both single cell and bulk RNA sequencing, um, if a model such as this has been validated in that setting. My impression is that because of the um, way that, like what we're looking at, the scale of um, individual transcripts, it seems much harder to develop the same kind of control data as what we're leveraging in this scenario. Um, but again, my uh, in, in these other genomics areas is, is pretty limited. So I would defer to other folks, but I'm, I would, I have been um, asking folks for years, like, has this been like carefully validated? Have folks really been, um, have folks thought about this in other settings? And I'm not um, yet convinced I have complete information on that. So happy to, um, happy to continue that conversation with you as well. All right, it looks like we have all questions can answered. I, can I pose one from the floor? Oh, okay, please. Hi there, Sorry. Yeah, thank you, wonderful presentation. Could you uh, bring up that slide of the dilution uh, data? I think it's like the third to last, perhaps. Yeah, let me see what I can do. Is this the slide you're after? Yeah, that's right. I thought there was incredible fidelity uh, in the right-hand slide, so I'm just trying to get a handle on um, what's going on on the left-hand side? What's going on These the are other side. analyses oh. being used? Yeah. Um, uh, let me see if I understand um, what, you're, what you're asking about I'm, here. So I mean, my understanding is that on the right-hand side, this is your model. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you're estimating the proportions extremely yeah. accurately for all of these. And on the left-hand side, something else has happened. What, what is going on over there? Yeah, thanks so much for asking, for asking me to clarify. So what we've shown on the left-hand side here is essentially the raw data that have been transformed into proportion scale. So um, if, you, if you look at just a single one of these dilution sets, this is the sum of all across all of these um, eight taxa plus an unclassified and plus um, some other, we've got a total proportion of one. As we observe from our WIJs divided by the sum overall I WIJ. So this is um, essentially what we are estimating under this model where true, where, where expected counts are proportional to true relative abundances. So plug-in relative abundances um, from our data are shown on the left-hand side. And then I think of it as corrected relative abundances for both contamination and detection effects on the right-hand side. Does that answer your question? I think so. Um, what were the confidence interval widths like on the on the right hand side? Great question. Yeah, and so um, I think as I as I mentioned, um, I believe we're learning from uh, I can't remember we're learning. I think we must be learning from three samples um, and trying to predict the composition of the sample here. So I would say that um, trying to apply pretend that n is large when n is three uh, sounds um, unreliable to me. And so uh, I would. Um, uh, we we didn't compute confidence intervals for this because the idea because I even I'm not even sure if confidence interval construction uh, throughout um, uh, M out of N bootstrap approach is possible with three samples. So so this is not a scenario where I'd encourage um, 
inference or hypothesis testing. This is more of a, a model fit um, illustration. But yeah, thanks for your question. We, if we were looking at more than um, uh, nine samples undiluted and then up to eight threefold dilutions, um, we could definitely compute those interval estimates. But in this case, uh, that's not possible, unfortunately. All right, any other questions? If not, let me say for our virtual audience, there is a reaction button, so please use those reactions. And for our live audience, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much all for coming. Have a good, enjoy the rest of your conference.